Hello, thank you for joining us today for the Department of Labor's 2022 Workers' Memorial Day program. My name is Natalicia Tracy, and I serve as a Senior Policy Advisor at OSHA. Each year on April 28, we pause to mark Workers' Memorial Day. It is a day for us to remember and honor all working men and women who lost their lives on a job as the result of work-related injury and illness. We mourn not only for those we've lost, but for those left behind, including their families, co-workers, and communities. Today, we'll hear from department leaders, members of Congress, organized labor, as well as from the people most impacted by fatalities, the families and friends of people who have died on a job. To begin our program, we'll hear from leaders of the Department of Labor. These public servants have spent many years working and advocating for workers, workers' rights, and improved worker safety. I invite you to read their bios to learn about their unique backgrounds in service on the Workers' Memorial Day page. First, I would like to introduce Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health, Mr. Doug Parker, followed by Assistant Secretary Williamson and Secretary Walsh. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. One of the things I do each week is sign condolence letters for families who lost someone they love to a preventable workplace fatality. Each letter begins, please accept my heartfelt condolences, followed by the words, for your husband, your son, your daughter, your mother, your uncle, su esposo, su hermano. I read each of their names and sign each letter because it's important not to see the thousands of workplace deaths each year as statistics, but as people, people who are being missed and grieved by the families they've left behind. On Worker Memorial Day, we pause to join families and loved ones in remembering and honoring the people they've lost. The fact is, every day is a memorial day and a day of remembrance for many families because 13 workers die each day from work-related injuries. So while we gather on this day to remember those who were lost, we also need to reflect on the work we do and how we can do it better so that others don't have to suffer such unbearable pain. I assure you, we are working at every level of OSHA to save lives, from rulemaking and aggressive enforcement to compliance assistance, training, and education. We are using all our tools to empower workers and ensure they are protected from workplace hazards. Yesterday, we began public hearings on a proposed final rule to protect healthcare workers from COVID-19 exposure. Earlier this month, Vice President Kamala Harris and Secretary Walsh joined workers in Philadelphia to announce OSHA's first national emphasis program on heat. On Tuesday, we will host a public forum on OSHA's ongoing activities to protect workers from heat-related hazards and introduce our rulemaking process and ways to participate in that process. You know, if you ask people what they value most, health and safety for themselves and for their loved ones, their families, that's at or near the top of the list. Health and safety for ourselves and our families is a core value that is ingrained in our lives. And we must do all that we can to make sure that worker health and safety is also a core value in every workplace in America. We should expect, even demand, that our workplaces are safe and healthy in the same way that we expect water to be safe to drink and air clean to breathe. The time to act is now because even as we gather on this solemn day, somewhere in America, a worker is being injured, sickened, or has lost their life simply because they went to work. So on this Worker Memorial Day, I invite you to join us as we fight to ensure that all workers have a voice in the safe and healthful workplace they deserve. We owe this to every worker, family, and community. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Chris Williamson, 
Assistant Secretary of Labor for Mine Safety and Health. I'm honored to serve alongside Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh, Deputy Secretary Julie Sue, Assistant Secretary for Occupational Safety and Health Doug Parker, and the department's dedicated team of worker safety and health professionals. All of us share a deep commitment to protecting the safety and health of our nation's workers. On Workers Memorial Day, we come together to remember those workers we have lost and honor their memory by recommitting our efforts to prevent future workplace tragedies. I was born and raised in a mining community in southern West Virginia. My family worked in underground and surface coal mines, operated heavy equipment and trucks, and worked in factories, sawmills, and construction, all workplaces that required great vigilance, communication between workers, and making safety a priority. Many of my childhood friends are miners today. I know firsthand the positive economic impact that the mining industry brings to many communities, like the one where I grew up. Sadly, I also know what can happen when mines are not operated safely, and miners are unnecessarily exposed to occupational hazards that can cause irreversible health problems, pain and suffering, and death. When Congress passed the Mine Act and created MSHA, it communicated with the force and effect of law the agency's primary mission, that the priority and concern of all in the coal or other mining industry must be the health and safety of its most precious resource, the miner. That clear instruction and principle are what guide our agency and its employees. Since the Mine Act became law in 1977, the mining industry has changed and evolved. So too has MSHA. With the work of our agency's programs and its mandatory safety and health standards, the development of new technologies by public and private entities, and joint efforts of government, labor, and the industry, mines are now safer and healthier by practically every historical metric. However, given expected demand increases in both the coal and metal and non-metal sectors, we all must renew our commitment to keeping miners safe and healthy. In other words, we have a lot of work to do, and I stand committed to making sure that it gets done. To better protect miners, we are working to increase the number of MSHA employees on the ground and ensure operators follow safety and health regulations. We are improving and developing new ways to communicate important safety and health information with miners more quickly and directly. We are informing miners about their rights and protecting them against retaliation if they choose to exercise those rights in the workplace. On this somber day that we remember the miners and workers we have lost, all of us, labor, industry, and government must work together toward our shared goal of protecting workers' safety and health. At MSHA, we remain committed to our statutory mission and ensure that those who choose the important mining profession can go to work and return home to their families and communities safe and healthy at the end of each shift. I'm proud to stand today with this strong leadership and represent the Mine Safety and Health Administration as we remember those workers we've lost and honor their memory by continuing the never-ending work of making workplaces safer. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us to commemorate Workers' Memorial Day in 2022. On Workers' Memorial Day, we remember and we honor the men and women who lost their lives on the job. We stand with their families, co-workers, and communities who miss them and we recommit to achieving a future when workplace fatalities are a thing of the past. The fact is, many of these tragic losses are preventable. If safety standards are followed, controls are in place, and safety and health are made a priority. That's why, at the Department of Labor, we hold a fundamental belief no worker should risk injury, illness, or their life to put food on the table for their families. We've made lots of progress making these workplaces safer. But still, over the past year, nearly 5,000 workers left for work and didn't come home. On this Workers' Memorial Day, we remember them and we reaffirm the right to a safe workplace for all. Over the past two years, families around the country have been impacted by COVID-19 and we've taken action to protect workers from infection on the job. OSHA is developing a rule to protect healthcare workers from the spread of infectious disease. 
and we're updating our guidance and our enforcement for all workers to reflect the latest science and data. As our recovery continues, we are focused on empowering all workers. So as people start new jobs, OSHA is making sure they have the information and training they need to safely perform their new role. And we want everyone to know you should be able to speak up about safety and health concerns in your workplace without fear of retaliation. It's important to know your rights and it's important for employers to know their responsibilities. It's also important for all of us to make equity a priority. For example, Hispanic or Latino workers made up 18% of the labor force in 2020, but they accounted for 23% of workers who died on the job. And some industries see more fatalities than others, including construction, agriculture, and transportation. These workers are entitled to the same protections as anyone, and we must do everything in our power to make sure they get them. At the U.S. Department of Labor, our mission is to ensure that all workers in every industry can stay safe and healthy on the job. No worker should have to put their paycheck ahead of their safety. So on Workers Memorial Day, we dedicate our work to the memory of those we have lost, and we commit to doing everything we can to make sure employers are doing their job so workers can safely do theirs. I want to thank you for your partnership in this work. This is Senator Patty Murray, and it is my honor to join Secretary Walsh, Assistant Secretary Parker, and the DOL to recognize Workers Memorial Day and remember and honor the workers across our country who have been killed or injured on the job. Every worker has the right to a healthy and safe workplace and the confidence that they'll return home safely at the end of each shift. But the unacceptable reality is that too many workers, as the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted, are still subjected to unsafe and dangerous working conditions. So as we take time today to remember and mourn those who have lost their lives from hazardous working conditions, I want you all to know I will never stop fighting to strengthen our workplace health and safety protections, hold employers accountable, protect and expand workers' rights, and ensure everyone is safe at work. Sebastian, a farm worker in Oregon, was just 38 years old when he died on the job from heat exposure. He was working in a 104 degree heat wave, trying to save money to have a baby when his future was cut tragically short. That didn't have to happen. His death was preventable and sadly all too common. Every day, 340 people die because of hazardous working conditions. That's 340 families losing a parent, a child, a sibling every single day. When employers don't keep our workplaces safe, it's workers and our families who pay the price. On Workers Memorial Day, all of us at the AFL-CIO and across the labor movement remember and mourn those we've lost. And we recommit to our fight for a safe workplace for every worker. Because we know that workplace injuries, illnesses, and deaths are preventable. Our farm workers and warehouse workers do not have to lose their lives by being forced to work in extreme heat. Our mine workers don't have to become increasingly ill after being exposed to dangerous silica and coal dust. And our healthcare professionals and essential workers on the front lines of the pandemic did not have to contract debilitating diseases while they were keeping our country running through the pandemic. Everyone should be able to work a shift without fear of getting sick or dying. We know how to make that happen, how to keep each other safe. We have to raise our collective voices until we have the standards and protections every worker deserves. We've done it before. Thanks to the tireless efforts of union members and our allies, the Occupational Safety and Health Act and the Mine Safety and Health Act went into effect 50 years ago. Those laws are a promise to every worker. They recognize that you have the right to a safe job. It is fundamental. And over the years, we've won more critical worker protections against silica, beryllium, coal dust, and many other hazards. Last year, we secured emergency COVID-19 protections for healthcare workers. 
But when 340 people die every day because of unsafe working conditions, it's clear. We all have to do more to deliver on that promise. So let's raise our collective voice again. Let's win stronger health and safety protections in our workplaces that address the inequities that workers of color have faced for too long. Let's create stronger job safety laws. Let's hold workplace safety agencies and employers accountable. And let's make sure that every worker has the right to a safe job and makes it home at the end of the day so that no one else's story ends like Sebastian's. That's what the labor movement commits to on Workers Memorial Day and every day. Thank you. Part of remembering and honoring those people who have been injured or died on a job is hearing their stories and understanding the impact on the families and communities they left behind. Recently, I had the opportunity to talk to workers and families who have incredible stories about the people they worked with who they knew and loved, but died as a result of preventable incidents on a job. By knowing and understanding the deeply personal stories, we realize that injuries and death are not just numbers and statistics, but they are people. First, I spoke to Jesse Stosenfels. Jesse has worked in coal mines for years, and I had the chance to hear about his experience in mining. I asked him about the relationship between miners and working together in that industry. Yes, it's a brotherhood. You uh, watch out for each other, take care of each other every day, try to make sure everybody's safe to get home to their families. In addition, he talked about the time he witnessed an accident that impacted his community of workers. His answer shook me. Well, in 2006, I was a coal miner at the Sego coal mine, and uh, we had an explosion that killed 12 men. Uh, only one survived. I, I worked there with all of those guys for many years. We then discussed his thoughts on what changes came about at his mine as a result of that terrible incident. There's been a lot of, of state and federal regulations that came out of, you know, those men perishing that has made the mines a lot safer, uh, you know, a lot more safe to work in. I am struck by the generational impact of the loss of this man that Jesse described. Not just the wives and children, but going back to the workers' grandparents. Well, it's pretty rough whenever, you know, the, the basically the person who brings the income home to the families doesn't come home. A lot of wives, children, you know, as, even as far as grandparents, parents, they suffered a lot because of the loss of their family. I also had the opportunity to talk to Alejandro Zuniga. Alejandro experienced firsthand being injured on the job. For three years, he suffered the consequences as did his family and the community around him. Yo experimenté una experiencia de intoxicación de monóxido de carbono en mi trabajo. Desgraciadamente, en la área de mi trabajo, ni mi patrón, ni en la escuela donde yo trabajaba, tenían las reglas de seguridad establecidas. Gracias a Dios, tres años después pude recuperarme y estar aquí con ustedes. Durante el accidente, es un impacto muy negativo porque yo tuve que tomar mucha terapia psicológica y terapia psiquiátrica. Mi familia, como mi mamá o mis hermanos, también fue muy difícil porque tuvieron que adaptarse a estar 24 horas cuidándome porque yo perdía la razón constantemente. El impacto es... Mmm, desastroso para toda la familia y es muy triste para la persona cuando nosotros lo vivimos. Esto nos causa un daño, un daño mental para toda la familia que vive con nosotros directamente o que está fuera de nuestra, en nuestros países también. En la sociedad es muy difícil también 
porque la sociedad cuen, se da cuenta que no hay un sistema que sea útil y que proteja al trabajador, vivientes, como yo. Okay. No hay nada que ayude a ellos a recuperarse y regresar a la sociedad a ser activos. Y muchos trabajadores, como yo, tal vez mueren, pero por la depresión o por las consecuencias que les causó esa lesión. Porque no hay realmente leyes que los protejan, patrones que los apoyen y son invisibles. Alejandro also shared his experience advocating on behalf of workers who have suffered injuries. Fue algo que ahora estoy trabajando como organizador por 10 años. Mm -hmm. eh, duré dos años de voluntario aprendiendo. Entonces ahora estoy como interino en el centro de trabajadores. Mm -hmm. Es muy triste acompañar a trabajadores ahora que estoy en esto cuando se quedan sin brazos, cuando se quedan sin pies. Uh -huh. um, es muy triste saber que llegan con nosotros y les decimos, la ley no protege. Este, está bien porque él no tiene el work stone. No es lo mismo cuando nosotros escuchamos las historias de los trabajadores, cuando a veces me toca estar ahí con ellos. Sí. Y es una cosa, no sé, no tiene nombre, no sabe uno, es una cosa... Eh, una explosión en la cabeza que dice uno, ¿qué estoy haciendo aquí? Y las leyes, ¿dónde están? Si no pueden proteger a estos hombres. Se queda uno muy triste porque si no tiene documentos y si no tiene identificación, entonces dice uno, ya es una persona, pero el sistema lo tiene como que si fuera, como que si no es una persona válida. Uh -huh. Si eres una persona, pero no tienes tanto validez, o sea, va bye, bye. Como, a ver cómo te las arreglas. Es muy triste. I also talked to Rena Harrington about her experience. Her son, Justin, died while working on a construction site. My son, Justin, was um, killed on January 18th, 2018. He was a construction worker. Uh, he was working on a house up in Gloucester, Mass, that had been, um, the house itself had been propped up uh, with cribbing and steel beams um, so a basement could be dug out um, and he was he it's my understanding he was on a uh, mini excavating machine that had no cab no roll bar or kill switch and he somehow became pinned between the machine itself and the one of the steel beams that was holding up the house uh, and he was crushed to death um, he was 27 years old Over 700 people came to his wake and the funeral, the church was filled to the rafters and he was just an, he was just an amazing person. He, he would just, his laugh was so infectious and he would just light up a room whenever he walked into a room. He was just an amazing kid. He really was. Of course, such tragic events make an impact on everyone, friends, families, and throughout the community. Rena describes that impact. We have a very small family. Um, I have two sisters um, and my daughter and my dad is still alive. Um, my mom passed away in 2015. So it, it's very small family, um, but it, it, It impacted everybody. It impacted the community, really, be, I think, because of his age. He had so many friends and everything, but it it's one of these. I walked around in a fog for two years, um, really, before I found USMWF, but I, you know, it's affected me personally in the fact that I, I'm not the same person that I was since he's passed. Um, there are certain things I, I cannot tolerate people that complain about their children. Um, I just get up and leave the room. <laughs> I just can't. And um, I can't, I have a hard time looking at construction equipment, literally looking at it. I just, my, I just physically have to turn away. It affects me physically. And um, it has, 
it, it's kind of brought my family closer together. Um, you know, we we all feel that it's we're all thankful that he's with my mom. Um, he's not alone. Um, and we're very, very thankful for that. And, you know, my daughter had a very hard time, but she's she's doing great now. Um, she's she's really, really doing great now. So um, she was very affected. They were best friends. They her and her brother were best friends and it really affected her. But uh, she's doing well now. So I was struck by Rena saying I'm not the same person that I was since his past. Sadly. That is true for thousands of people every year across the country because of preventable deaths in workplaces. I asked Jesse, Alejandro, and Rina, what more needs to be done to protect workers? What can we do to help ensure that no one else experiences this kind of loss? Their experiences matter, and we need to hear their voices. Well, one thing is to never do away with the regulations that have became because of mine accidents. Never get backwards, always look forward. You know, you, you can never make a workplace too safe, but you can take away safety. Los departamentos de Ocha o El Trabajo tengan leyes que castiguen a los patrones, pero sean castigos fuertes para que el patrón Tenga miedo de romper una ley. My son's company was a subcontractor. He was a very small company, less than 10 people, a very uh, family, um, family owned business um, that I don't think they, they can take advantage of any OSHA training or know about any OSHA training. And I think a lot of it is education. Um, I, I think OSHA needs to be able to reach out to, to everyone, small businesses and large businesses, to be able to offer training um, and, and education on workplace um, safety. And I think that, I think a lot of it is, um, is the fines are, you know, I, I don't think the, the fines really equal to are equal to what happens everybody should have a chance to go home their family should never have to worry about them coming home and workers should always feel that they can say something and not not feel the effects of repercussions of being fired or anything like that and like i said we just need to keep going forward not backwards each of them shared their final thoughts on what they want all of us to take away on this Workers' Memorial Day. Entonces, para nosotros las familias, un trabajador vale mucho. No necesita que mueran cinco o diez. Con uno que muera en la familia es suficiente. Entonces, los departamentos encargados de esto tienen que trabajar más como si estuvieran defendiendo a su familia. Si una persona de Ocha y el departamento de oficinas, de lo que sea, cuando se sienta en la oficina y piensa, voy a hacer leyes que defiendan a mis hijos, voy a hacer leyes que defiendan a mis padres, a mis hermanos, mm -hmm. esa ley va a tener un impacto verdadero en el trabajador. I would just like to say that um, since finding United Support Memorial for Workplace Fatalities in 2019, um, I've become a very active family member and board member for this organization. It's unfortunate that an organization such as this needs to exist, but it does. And I am hoping that Justin's voice will be, will turn tragedy into prevention and change. Thank you to all of today's speakers. We are grateful for your time and for sharing your thoughts and experiences. We especially appreciate Jesse, Alejandro, and Rina for sharing their stories with us. We are all better off for having heard their stories and we wish for strength for them and as they continue to deal with their losses. Thank you for watching and joining us in remembering those who have been lost to workplace fatalities. I hope your involvement does not end here. 
It will take all of us, we at the Department of Labor, our union brothers and sisters, workers and family advocate, and every one of you. Whether you are an employer, a worker, family, or friend, we must keep making progress so that one day events like this will be a distant memory. We have to keep fighting until every worker is able to go home to their family at the end of each day, safe and healthy. Thank you again for joining us.